Hello, welcome. This is Dr. Morton, and uh, this is an overview of uh, Logic Design Chapter 17. And in this chapter, we're gonna we're gonna make an attempt to uh, begin the process to teach um, how to develop algorithms, especially sequential algorithms. Although uh, there clearly are also parallel algorithms, and we're gonna define what an algorithm is, and we're gonna uh, try and talk about some basic algorithms. We're also going to talk about systems, and uh, specifically systems that are digital in nature and that often have a microprocessor or uh, some sort of digital processor, maybe in the form of an FPGA, um, uh, working as the as the intelligence of the device. With that, let me um, transition to the uh, the book. So here we are, and let's see, I hope, I think, yeah, I think that's good. All right, yeah, and you can see me in a little inset. All right, so chapter 17, and we have this little picture here, which is kind of the icon for the chapter. And notice we have some gears over here trying to do something, and we have step one, step two, three, four, five, six, seven, and finally done. So an algorithm, at least a sequential algorithm, is made up in the form of steps. And uh, it has several features. We'll cover those in just a second. Let's first talk about the learning objectives. And uh, so I want you to be able to write an algorithmic solution for a push button user interface. We'll talk about that. I want you to be able to describe two logical approaches to developing an algorithm for a sequence detector. And then uh, fin finally, we'll talk about uh, at least three typical challenges when designing a user interface. Um, we have some terms in our glossary, user interface, algorithm, sensor, display, and actuator. Uh, so uh, l l we'll go through the definition of an algorithm. So it's the process or steps to follow in the problem-solving operation typically implemented with a combination of hardware and software. It usually includes processing signals or data from various sensors and may have both parallel and serial operations. There is usually some form of output to either mechanical actuators or perhaps uh, displayed in some useful manager on various types of displays. And displays, uh, it's a hardware device that turns digital information into a physical signal that can be sensed with one or more biological senses. Images, sound, haptic sense, tactile sense, smell, taste, some other senses. Common examples are monitors, liquid crystal displays, speakers, lights, vibrators, buzzers. And an actuator, a uh, class of devices that act on physical objects in some mechanical way, usually involving movement, but could include heat or other effects. Uh, an electric motor is usually part of an actuator and could be controlled by an H-bridge or a stepper motor or a servo. Also, it could be a solenoid that causes, uh, that's consists of a, of a coil with a ferrous shaft that the shaft moves when the coil is activated and can uh, cause changes over small distances. Um, and often it moves in the reverse direction based on a, a spring um, when the coil is de de deactivated. Um, okay, so these are also considered uh, a form of output device or display. All right, so why do we need algorithms? Well, we, we need algorithms to get things done. Um, since human existence, we, we've been coming up with algorithms. Um, a recipe for making bread, for taking care of livestock efficiently, for growing, for planting and harvesting crops, um, for building pyramids and designing structures that will, uh, will, will stand on their own and not fall down. Um, all these require the development of algorithms to, uh, to, to bring them about. So let me just talk about this for a minute. So this is kind of our, our at least my uh, construct for a, a, uh, a system. And this is a system that's going to execute an algorithm. In a second, we're going to look at the, 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 the features that define an algorithm. We've talked about it de as a definition above, but, but we'll look at it in a little more detail in a second. But here's our system. The central part of the system is a processor, and this usually involves logic elements, um, typically in the form of a microprocessor or a field programmable gate array, or maybe a dedicated integrated circuit chip that's that's not necessarily a microprocessor, but somehow executes uh, our algorithm. Um, we have, uh, going into the processor, sensors. Some of those sensors are driven by operator input or human input, and some of them are driven perhaps by, uh, by environmental 
uh, sensors that sense uh, shaft position, temperature, pressure, motion, um, uh, angle of inclination, things like that, uh, gravity, who knows. Uh, we also uh, have some displays and actuators. So those are the outputs from the process. And then those, those display and actuators generate feedback. Some of it could be just an operator interpreting data on a, on a computer monitor uh, and then making changes through these input sensors to the process. Uh, some of these could be automated loops where, uh, where there's a, a, an, an output that represents a temperature that's sensed and then that value is fed back to, to, for the processor to control uh, maybe a heater or whatever or a cooler and then of course thrown into this mix we always have some noise um, which could involve our sensor inputs which could change our uh, our our the the effect of our outputs or maybe our feedback or it could be maybe confusing to the operator uh, it could come up in a lot of ways um, okay and so what we're talking about is the algorithm that's going to that's going to be executed by this processor to get something done using uh, input and output. All right, so characteristics of an algorithm. So here's a, here we have four characteristics. These are kind of generally accepted as what constitutes an algorithm. First of all, it has to be precisely describable. That is, it can be written in a computer language or implemented with a digital network. Secondly, it, that, and that would be, say, a logic expression. Secondly, uh, it has a defined start and end, but it can be in a uh, endlessly repeated loop. But still, that loop would have a start and an end. The steps of the algorithm are ordered, but could have a lot of different branches, and uh, depending on conditions encountered uh, while the uh, algorithm is running. And then the algorithm must be able to be executed by digital logic elements or a computer, or maybe a field programmable gate array, or some type of, of logic chip. All right, so that's kind of what we mean by an algorithm. Now, this is a, it turns out to be sort of a complex subject and I find, I am, I find it a little bit challenging to try and teach this uh, because it's, um, whereas it's reasonably straightforward, say, for me to think of, of um, say, to have a problem and then come up with maybe an algorithm to solve it, my experience with my uh, micro one students has been that oftentimes, or and even my logic design students, has been that sometimes coming up with that algorithm is is, is difficult, uh, and, and and then there are cases where I've had great difficulty coming up with an algorithm. Um, so uh, so it can be difficult to to uh, develop algorithms, and and uh, and so we're going to try and hopefully improve that ability by by doing some. Uh, doing some simple sort of cases and kind of illustrating how they can actually be more complicated uh, than meets the eye. So with that said, uh, let me go back to the book and I want to I want to go on down. So one of the most common types of input devices that we might see is, is this uh, is this push button. It, it's poorly illustrated here, but here you have a little switch and you can think of this as a spring loaded button that's normally open, but when you push it, it's closed. And when you let go of it, the spring makes it open back up. And we want to connect this to the pin of a microprocessor, one of its input-output ports. We call these GPIO, General Input-Output Port. And we program it to be an input in this case, so that it's, it's, it, so that it's going to sense whether this input is uh, high, which would be the, the operating voltage of the micro. We call that VDD or ground, sometimes we, well, usually we call that VSS. So VDD or VSS, uh, in this case, let's say we're running it at 3.3 volts. So that would be 3.3 volts or ground. Now we usually, we, we have it set up this way. Uh, we, we need this pull up resistor here. Uh, there are some cases where the processor itself can have a built in, uh, built in resistor. You know what, let me, Give me one second. I'm going to turn off. Yeah, I wanted to change those lights. Okay, so, so if we if we leave this um, if we leave this open here, so here's our input to the micro, uh, and we have this resistor here that's connected to 3.3 volts. So if the switch is open, we pull this pin up to 3.3 volts. So even though we usually put a 
10,000 ohm resistor here or something about that size because we don't want it to be super big because we want the pin to go up the VDD very quickly. But on, by the same token, uh, we don't want it so small that when we close the switch, there's a lot of current flowing through the resistor because we have ground. So from 3.3 volts straight to ground, that's going to go through this resistor. So if it's 10,000 ohms, that's going to be that's going to be a very small amount of current. Um, the the pin itself has very high impedance input. So uh, what would happen if we did not put this pull-up resistor? Well, when the switch is open, the pin would float to some voltage level. And the problem is that because you can electrostatically induce voltages on these floating inputs, if you brought your hand with a negative charge close, it would drive it to ground. If you brought your hand with a positive charge, it might drive it towards VDD. And so the processor could read one or read zero, depending on uh, which way your hand was turned. And as you move things around and things moved by the processor, the induced voltages could be different. And you could absolutely see uh, uh, different readings. So to, to give it a robust level of functioning, we want to make sure that it, when the switch is open and the, and the pin is not otherwise driven, that it is specifically driven by this 10,000 ohm resistor going up the 3.3 volts. Now, a lot of microprocessors do have built-in pull-ups. Uh, the ones we use in Micro One, they're, they're called weak pull-ups. They're so weak that they don't really work uh, for this purpose because they, they, they take too long to pull the pin up and they're really not that robust. Um, so so we, we don't use the internal pull-ups uh, in, in, for, for a, an input like this, we, we put an external pull-up. But there are some micros that have strong internal pull-ups, and we could use those in that case. Um, so how does this actually work? Well, when the button is not pushed, the pin will have the processor voltage on it, VDD, which is, say, 3.3 volts. So the pin will read a 1, because we, we always read a high voltage as a 1 and a ground as a 0 voltage as a low, as a 0. So it'll read 1. If on the other hand we close the switch, then the pin will definitely be pulled to ground because all 3.3 all volts minus maybe a few tenths of a, of a, maybe a few microvolts really, the rest of it will be dropped across this resistor because there's very little current flowing into the pin here and, uh, and almost all of it, and the wire has negligible resistance, so almost all the voltage will be dropped across this resistor and it'll read essentially ground. It'll read zero volts. So when the button's pushed, it reads a one, and when it's not pushed, it reads a zero. Okay? All right, so how would we write a small computer program to run on this microprocessor to read this push button reliably and robustly? Sounds like it ought to be easy, so let's look. So first, first brush, we'll want to do a program where we wait till the button reads zero. And let's say we're just going to, we want to test our concept here. So we're going to increment a counter when we read, when the button's pushed. And then we'll just do it again. So let's set that up with a small computer program. Um, so I'm going to, uh, let's see, I think I have, yeah, I need to do this. So if we look at the, uh, if we look at the code, right here, um, yeah, actually, maybe, not. Uh, so what, what we can see, and I think this is, I think we can see this, yeah, okay. So I wrote, I wrote several different chunks. Um, so I wrote three infinite, uh, four infinite loops, infinite loop one, infinite loop two, infinite loop three, and infinite loop four. Now it turns out that we can only run one of these at a time because you can only have one infinite loop. Uh, so the rest of them uh, won't execute because we'll always be stuck in this one to begin with. And then I'll comment this one out and we'll run this one. Then I'll comment it out and we'll run this one. Then I'll comment it out and we'll run this one. And we're gonna look at several different, different things. So first, let's just run this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and, and compile the program and load it into a board. And then, um, so I'm going to, uh, so it's, it's finished running now. Uh, and now we're gonna look at the hardware. So here's, here's the board. This is one of the boards we use in Micro One. 
we we've designed a new board but we uh, implemented it last spring but we couldn't do it last fall and we can't do it this this coming this this spring because we do not have uh because they're the, the, the chips are in such short supply we can't get enough chips so we we did get enough of these chips so we're going to reuse this board all right so here we are um and and this is a little microprocessor chip here and that that is going to run our algorithm that we just you just saw our computer program and here we have a little hex display and you can see this hex display is also being driven by the micro and it's connected with these wires here it, this is being run by what's called uh, i2c inter integrated circuit and so so right now our count is zero now if we push the button we'd expect the count to go to one right and then if we push it again, two, and push it again, three, and so forth. So let's push it for a little bit, and we'll see what happens. Oh my goodness, it went to 1,097. Let's do it again. It went to 48,512. Oh my goodness. Uh, now it's back to 1,209. Okay, so why are we reading thousands of, uh, of, of pushes when we only push it one time? Well, let's, let's think about this. So... If we go back and look at the code, uh, what happens is we wait here until the button is pushed. So this not RB7 means when RB7 is zero, then we, we do this. And, and if, we, we, if RB7 is one, then we skip this and we just write out the value of count. So the value of count won't change except when RB7 is pushed. But here's the problem. Notice we have these brackets here. So when RB7 is pushed, it's going to execute count plus one, and then it's potentially going to do it again and again. And uh, we're not actually using this delay. I'm going to get rid of it. So, um, so basically, it's just, going to, it's just going to keep counting as long as the button's pushed. Now, I didn't hold the button down very long, less than a second, I think. But remember, this microprocessor is executing more than a million instructions per second. Now those are assembly language instructions. Our C instructions uh, are implemented with a handful, and typic typically with a handful of assembly language instructions, sometimes one or two, and sometimes thousands. But in this case, probably, probably a handful. Um, and so because of that, uh, it won't be quite one to one, but in one second, we could theoretically do a million counts. Now, the other limiting factor is I set count up as an integer, and on this particular uh, machine with this particular compiler, for this particular chip, uh, our 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 uh, unsigned integer is is defined as uh, 16 bits, which means the highest it can count to is 65,000 something, and then it'll overflow and start back over at zero. So that's why we get funny numbers. Uh, if I don't hold the button down, if I reset it each time and held it down, maybe a fraction of a second, then I'd probably get a pretty big number. If I held it down too long, I'll, it'll roll over the 65,000 and it might get a lower number, even though it's actually counted more counts. So uh, so that's what's going on with that. All right, so if we go back to our book, let's see if we can do that. Uh, and so let's look. So, so here we have our, our problem. So we wait till the button reads zero, increment the counter and repeat. But it turns out, because the computer's running millions of instructions per second, and human finger on the button is not moving very fast, maybe half a second, hundreds of milliseconds anyway, we're going to do lots of these loops before we get our finger off the button. Okay, so uh, what can we do? How can we work on this? Well, so we can, we can add another step. So we can add a step before this step. We can wait, we can wait here as long as the button uh, reads one, and then uh, when it no longer reads one, then it's gonna read zero, so then we can increment the counter, and then instead of going back to here, we'll go back to here, so that that uh, that we'll, we'll wait till the button reads, so if you take your finger off the button, then hopefully it'll read one again, and we'll stop here and wait for the next push. So let's, let's try something like that. Um, Okay, so I'm going to go back. Um, I'm going to go back over here, and uh, so we're comment out the first the first cycle here. We'll comment out this this first loop right here. We'll just go ahead and use this little 
help screen thing uh, right here. And then uh, we're going to do this code down here. Oops, I messed something up. I didn't comment out this one. Yeah, it caused an error. Okay. Now we should be good. All right, so this is infinite loop two. And uh, so now we're going to skip this one. We're going to only execute this one. And we won't ever get to loops three and four yet. Uh, so now we're going to do while RB7. And then we're going to check. We're using an if statement. If, uh, if our, so as long as the button's high, we're going to do this while loop. And then inside the while loop, we'll check to see if the button went low. And we'll add one to count. So let's see how that works. Um, that's one thought about how we might solve this. And maybe you can see some problems with this, maybe not. So let's let's look. All right, so there's our um, there's our it's compiled. All right, so now here we are. And and so we'll push the button. Zero. Okay. Oh that's one. Oh that was good. That worked. I put, oh, it didn't work. That worked. That didn't work. That worked. That didn't work. It didn't work. That worked. That worked. Didn't, 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 didn't. Okay, so there's no guarantee whether it's going to work or not. We don't know. There it worked again. So it's very unreliable. Sometimes it counts the push. Sometimes it doesn't. All right. Well, what's the problem? Well, let's look at it. So we'll go back to our code. And what we can see is, yeah, we can see that... Uh, so as long as the button's high, we execute this. So what if we test to see if the button's low? And then when we come back and we test to see if the button's high, we've already let go of the button. So, or, or well, we test to see if the button's high, and then we go here and it's not, and it's still high, so we don't count. But if, then if, if, then, uh, then we push the button. When it comes back up here, we test it again, and the button's low now, so we don't do this while loop, so we skip down here and just print, and we don't add anything to count. And then when we come back up here, we test it again, and now it's low, uh, so we test it. Maybe now we have a count, uh, and then uh, we come back up and test it again, and it's not, it's not high, so we just drop down. So then we might, we might get a count. But it depends on when we push the button. If we push the button at the wrong time, we can miss it, and uh, and then go back here and and we'll we'll either the button's low and this whole while loop will be stopped, and we'll just be repeating the print statement. And it'll, when we repeat the print statement, you won't really see anything because it's going to print out the same value for count each time, and it's going to overwrite itself. So so we're not going to really see anything change. Okay, so so that doesn't seem to work too good. So what can we do differently? Well, let's uh, let's comment this out. We'll try a new approach. So here we are. Okay, now we'll go down here to loop three. All right. So now we're gonna we're gonna wait here while while the RB seven is um, is high, and then when it finally goes low, we'll drop through. And then we'll wait here uh, while it's low, and then when uh, when it's no longer low, it's back to high. We'll add one to count. We'll print it out, and we'll go back up here, and we'll wait here until we punch the button again. All right, that looks like it ought to work. So let's see what happens. All right, and we'll transition over here. All right, we're all set up with our new code. And so we'll do this. That's Oh, it counted twice with one push. Oh. How about that? Three times. Oh, three times there with one push, or maybe two. So seven, eight, oh, oh, eight, nine. It counted two. Ten, eleven, oh, thirteen. It counted three times. Okay, so we see there's a problem with this one. So what's going on? Well, so what happens is uh, when we push the button, we drop through, we do the count, and then, uh, and then, uh, we write this out, but then we come back up here and uh, very fast, and uh, the buttons, maybe now it's high, but it's bouncing a little bit, 
And so it bounces a couple times, so it actually does this loop two or three times on each push because of bouncing. And bouncing bouncing's a big problem with mechanical buttons. When you when you um, when you push uh, a button, um, then uh, if it's mechanical, the the contacts when they make contact, they don't just make a perfect contact, but they kind of bounce like that a few times in a in just a few milliseconds, and so then that causes that causes the computer to sense multiple pushes. And so that sends us around the circuit, say, three times. Now, it would be even worse, but, uh, but because you can see in the code, we, we, we do this printout, which takes a few instructions. And these are actually long instructions. So we're adding quite a bit of a delay here in this, in this printout code. And then it actually writes it out to the screen. You don't see it. It happens so fast. But since the count doesn't change, you, you don't see any change. And so, uh, so this is actually adding some delay. Otherwise, we'd probably get much more than, say, two or three counts. We'd we, extra, or extra counts. We would get uh, maybe hundreds extra counts. So we so this this isn't really a good solution. So let's uh, comment this out and let's see what can we do. We'll go back to the document here and we'll come back to this here. Let's see. Oops. Uh, oh, oh, shouldn't have done that. Let me. Okay, what I wanted was the other one. I wanted this one. Okay. Oh, and I didn't do it all. All right. Here we go. Okay, now we'll get it. Okay. All right, so now we've commented this out. I'm going to go ahead and assemble it and load it, but I want to go back to the book here. So uh, let me do that real quick. Okay, so... Okay, so now, so so now what we're gonna do? We have wait till the button reads one, wait till the button reads zero, increment the counter, and wait. Now I'm gonna wait a little longer than five milliseconds, and just to make it a little more robust, I'm gonna put the wait not just here, but I'm also gonna put it between this wait and this wait, just to reduce the chance that a bouncing switch is gonna trigger these a couple of times. And uh, I'm going to make it 100 milliseconds instead of 5 milliseconds just to make sure there's no chance that I have any bouncing left going on. Okay, so let is, let's look at that. So, so here's what I'm going to do right here. So I'm going to add in a 100 millisecond delay after the first while. And, and then I'm going to add 100 milliseconds here after the second one. You could put the count after or before this. It doesn't really matter. And then we'll do the printout. And then we'll go back and do it again. But because we add these delays, it should eliminate any bouncing effect, and we should see a nice, robust switch performance. So, so let's see. I think I already programmed it in. So let's make the transition over here. And OK, now uh, I'm just going to push the button. And let's see. There's one count, two, three. Now if I hold the button down a long time, I still get just one push, five, Six and if I do it fast, I'm not skipping numbers. So 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. See, it's it, I don't I'm not getting any extra buttons. So I have a fairly uh, I have a fairly robust um, implementation now. Now the only downside is it's costing me 200 milliseconds of time to read the button, which might be a problem. I might not want to take that much time away from my processor. So uh, maybe I should shorten those a little bit. And I can shorten them in, in, to the point where I start to get erratic performance. And then I could move them back up a little bit. And, and, and that would be a good point to set them at. So I've probably been a little more generous on my delay here than I really needed to be. OK. So, um, so hopefully what, what you see from this is that that we have um, we had to put a little work in to get this fairly simple functionality of reading a push button a simple momentary momentary close normally opened push button and uh, and just to avoid things like bouncing uh, and multiple reads uh, but I haven't even gotten complicated 
supposing I wanted to allow you to uh, hold the button down and and count you know extra pushes like for instance a normal keyboard uh, on your on your desktop or laptop computer if you hold down one of the keys and you wait just a short time you'll start getting multiple of those keys well we didn't even we didn't even think about implementing something like that so we could we could add, we could add that to this routine uh, by adding some more software and it would make it even more complicated and um, so there's all sorts of things and we could also have uh, have some fancy things uh, like we can use mouse buttons we can have fast clicks and slow clicks double clicks um, yeah there's a lot of things we can do with a, a simple push button that are really powerful uh, holding it while we drag click and hold all that kind of stuff so you can see uh, we do use the push buttons quite a bit and uh, and making a robust uh, super uh, effective uh, piece of code to do exactly what we want with this hardware is challenging it can be very challenging all right so um, let's let me go back to the book all right so moving along so I want to talk about a few other things and, and just get through the remainder of this chapter um, I don't want this to get too long it's already at 31 minutes so we'll we'll try and uh, try and move along here but I did want to make the I did want to make the point that uh, what looks like a simple interface of a button uh, requires some some modestly well thought through and sophisticated software, at least somewhat sophisticated. All right, what if we want to input uh, a whole range of values instead of just uh, a push or not a push? Well, this is where a potentiometer can be very useful. And notice how we hook one end of the potentiometer, oops, one end of the potentiometer up to uh, power and the other end up to ground. And then this goes into a pin. Now this pin, we don't we we take one of our GPIO pins and we turn it into an analog input by selecting one that's connected uh, to the analog to digital converter. And so once we do that, we can use the analog to digital converter to uh, to change the voltage from zero to say 3.3 volts into a number depending on how many bits of resolution our A to D uh, converter has. For the, for the chip we use in Micro 1, it has a 10-bit A to D. For the chip we use in Micro 2, it has a 16-bit A to D. Uh, you can get fancier A to Ds, but 16 bits is pretty good. 16 bits gives you uh, uh, 65,000 or 64,000 plus values you can pick. Um, 10 bits gives you 1,000, 1024, 1K, if you will. And so that's what we have with our a microprocessor that we're using here is we have a value uh, from 0 to 1023 which gives us 1024 different values because you have to count the zero all right so uh, so that's that's and what's really nice about this you can use this to set uh, the level wherever you want and uh, there are also some really fancy features for instance you can instead of using uh, VDD the processor voltage that it's running at you can lower that by using a, uh, uh, a reference based on, uh, say, a built-in chip in the microprocessor that allows you to, to pick a voltage of uh, uh, 1.024 volts or 2.048 or 4.096. And what that allows you to do, it allows you to, when you divide by, uh, you know, a thousand, it, it, lets your, it lets you have a nice even uh, number of uh, uh, fractional millivolts for each count so sometimes we'll use funny numbers like that sometimes we'll raise the ground up with an external reference uh, maybe raise it the ground up to one volt um, and and so then our range is shrunk and that's our sometimes if we have a signal that doesn't vary between ground and say 3.3 volts uh, then in that then then for our uh, analog input we might have to condition it but when we're using this as a simple input device to set a threshold or to put in a number, uh, we can like say a number from one to 1,023, fine, no problem. We can just do this directly. What if we wanted to do a number from zero to 100? Well, then we would just scale it. Uh, we divide by uh, 1024 and we multiply, or by 1023 and we multiply by 10. And that would scale it nicely from zero to, 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 to 10. Or maybe, hmm, yeah, I, we have to think about that. Uh, yeah, 
something like that. Have to make sure we have to round round down or round up correctly. All right. Uh, so that's that's an example of a pot. Um, okay. Um, what about it? What about on the output side? Well, the simplest output device we can typically use for uh, our system is an LED, and it looks a little bit like this. Now, in this case, uh, we are connecting uh, the uh, the we're, we're using an input to the LED. Uh, we're using the uh, the ca uh, we're using the uh, yeah I didn't I didn't this drawing's wrong it's backwards. So in this case. Uh, we're using the cathode through this resistor to the pin, and we're taking the anode and connecting it to VDD. But, uh, so to turn this one on, no, I said that wrong. We're connecting the anode through the resistor to the pin, and the cathode through the resistor should go to ground, VSS. Uh, but in this case, I didn't write the right thing here. I've got to fix that. Uh, so this should be VSS. So when the pin is zero then the led will be off and when the pin is one the led will be on now uh on the on the board that uh we use in micro one we set our, our rgb led up so that when the pin reads one the led is off and when it reads zero it's on and we did that for 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 reasons having to do with uh uh, that it's better to sync current than to source current from peripheral pins. But in any event, and we don't have to, and we can use a straight GPIO pin for this, only we use it in output mode instead of input mode. Now you might think, well, that's great. We have a, we can turn on or off this LED, but that's, that's not a very, uh, that's not a very, uh, that's a pretty simple display. Uh, you know, you can't really, display much information on that, right? And I go, well, actually, you can do a lot of things with a sim simple LED. Uh, you, can, uh, you can just turn it on and off, obviously, but you can also uh, blink it. And you're, once you blink it, you can blink it in different ways. You can have it uh, with a long on time and a short off time, or you can have it with a short on time and a long off time. Or you can blink it fast at a very quick rate, or you can blink it at a medium rate, or you can blink it slowly. Uh, and, and then you can have all sorts of complicated blink patterns. You could go long, long, short, long, long, or who knows what. You could send Morse code with it, so you could actually transmit the alphabet. And in fact, uh, many of you spend a lot of time with a remote control in your hand, uh, looking at uh, your television or your screen or whatever, and in your remote control, there's a little infrared LED that's transmitting complicated signals that tells the receiving uh, IR, IR transmitter, it's an it's a IR transistor receiver. It, that receiver picks up these complicated signals and determines whether you want the channel to go up one or down one, the volume to go up one, turn everything off, turn everything on. Uh, it, it does all sorts of uh, fancy things. And that's just that, 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 that display device on that remote control is simply an, an infrared LED, just, just like you see here on the, uh, would be infrared instead of visible light. All right, so a, a little more complicated uh, output device could be a, a PWM signal. And <clears throat> so here's, here's kind of what that looks like. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, a servo. And we drive that servo with a PWM signal. So a servo consists of several parts, and this is this breaks down uh, the parts of a servo. And uh, I'll show you a servo. Here's what one looks like. Uh, you can see it's got a it's got a servo horn here, and usually we have a little plastic horn or or maybe a fancier metal horn we put on here, and then it usually has a little three wire cable, ground, power, and a signal. And the signal is a PWM signal, and that's that's how it uh, that's how it gets powered. And um, it doesn't take a lot of a lot of uh, current or anything, um, and it's a and and there you can get them for you know say five dollars, five or six dollars if you get relatively cheap hobby ones, uh, and of course you can pay a hundred dollars for one of these hobby servos too if you get a fancy one or maybe even more, uh, and then of course at the industrial level they make very large servos that cost you know tens of thousands of dollars or maybe maybe even a hundred thousand dollars. So there's some pretty powerful ones, and of course they're a lot more precision 
and all that. Okay, so uh, the way this works, we the PWM signal, which is the signal wire, comes in here, and and it it gets converted from uh, pulse width to voltage, uh, and we use a we use a pretty standard approach with these uh, uh, these analog servos. There's also digital servos you can use <clears throat> that are a little different, but the analog servos <coughs> are are are. Our, our PWM signal has a prescribed pulse width, and, and then within that, your duty cycle varies from 5% to 10%. With, uh, with, uh, usually it causes the motion of the servo arm to, or we call it the servo horn, but it goes up minus 90 degrees to plus 90, so it has a 180 degree range. And within that range, um, the way this works, our PWM signal tells it what angle to be at, and that goes into a comparator. There's a potentiometer that's on the output shaft. You saw the little, that little uh, brass output shaft. And that, that potentiometer tells it where that output shaft is from minus 90 to plus 90. And uh, it sends that into the comparator. And the comparator then compares what's commanded with what's actually being, uh, what actually exists. And if, and if they're not the same, then an error signal is generated which drives the motor through a big reduction gearbox to, uh, to move the output shaft to the right angle. And once it achieves that angle, then it, st then it stays right at that angle until you change the input PWM signal. So that's how these work. And, um, and they work pretty well. And that's, that's a very inexpensive way to get, uh, to get uh, a, a mechanical motion uh, controlled by a microprocessor. Now, again, we have other types of things. We have just regular motors that could turn on and off, say, a conveyor belt or whatever. Or we have um, stepper motors. And uh, uh, stepper motors, we can step them uh, in very, very fine steps, typically much more accurately than we can a, uh, a servo. But the problem with stepper motors is we don't have this pot that tells us how the shaft is, is aligned. So we have to have limit switches. And we run them out to the limit switch. And then we say, OK, that's, that's your maximum value, or that's your minimum value. and then then every time you step it, uh, you count your steps, whether you go left or right, uh, or clockwise or counterclockwise or whatever, and, um, and you make sure you count so that you don't overrun your limits and you know exactly what your limits are. So, so you have to have limit switches uh, and you have, to, you have to register them every time you power them up, for the most part, uh, unlike, a, say, a servo where you know how the shaft is positioned because it's got an ind indicator built into it. And you just send a signal to tell you, tell it what angle you want the shaft to be at. Okay, so uh, obviously one of the things, um, let's see, I have a little video that shows this, um, this tilt table. This is another example of, say, a control algorithm. Uh, let's see if I can pull this up. Maybe you don't know this electromagnetic screw bit, but this is really my best see if we can get rid of it. Okay, so this is this is a little uh, touch panel. Uh, this little glass piece is a touch panel, and it senses this ball bearing position uh, and feeds that back through this cable into a microprocessor down here in the lower right corner. And that microprocessor then has two servos: one that tilts the table uh, on the x-axis and one that tilts the y-axis. And in moving it around, they keep the ball centered basically in the middle of the, the tilt table. That's the whole idea. Uh, and the quality of this algorithm can determine, you know, uh, how good this tilt table is. Can you roll the ball on pretty quickly and will it catch it? Or do you have to kind of place it on gently and, and not, not give it too much velocity? And sometimes if it gets a little goofed up, it'll, uh, it'll forget where the ball is. And for this, we use what's called a, a proportional integral derivative controller, uh, which is a standard feature uh, in the uh, control world. And, uh, and this works pretty good. And this is one of the things we do in Micro 2. Okay. So let me... So, um, yeah. So there we go. All right. So so that's an example. Um, so, uh, so now I want to just talk about uh, kind of the last part of the chapter. We're going to talk about this uh, a little more complicated um, uh, system. And here, here we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the uh, some of the some of the system-based design 
uh, tools that we have. Now, uh, when you take uh, uh, Senior Design uh, 1 and Senior Design 2, then you're going to go through a, lot, a fair amount of training on this, and hopefully you'll learn how to work through a design process and come up with a, with a functioning system for your capstone project. But we're going to take, say, uh, uh, so let's say you have a company and uh, your boss tells you that he wants you to lead the team to develop a new toaster oven. And you've got some mechanical engineers and you've got some um, electrical engineers and maybe some software guys and you're going to do this toaster oven. Um, so, uh, so there are a number of steps and I, I'm, this is going to be a little bit of a crude attempt but I just want you to start thinking about this. And, uh, and a lot of times what I'll do is an in-class uh, sort of little project to get you to, to think about, well, what are some of the things you'd have to do? So, uh, so the first thing to do is to sit down and describe all of the required functions uh, that the system's going to have to do. And, and basically, these are the specifications for performance. And, and within that, you're going to include some of the specifications that, uh, that the boss has in mind to make this a competitive product. Right? So you're not going to just slap together anything you can, but you're actually going to have to come up with something that, 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 um, that checks the square. And you know, maybe, has, uh, maybe it's got some, some unique feature that makes it a tr an attractive product and it gets you a market share and you can actually make some money. And that, of course, is one of the beauties of capitalism. You, you are forced uh, through market forces to make a product that people actually want or you go out of business rather than stuffing down their throats the only product they can buy in a typically in a in a in a more socialist system where production is controlled exclusively by the government and they make one toaster oven and if you don't like it tough you can't get a different toaster oven that's the only one that you can buy all right well anyway so uh without the politics let's go through these so the first step uh so so maybe we're gonna we have to have uh controls for uh for the controlling the heating coils and we'll have a coil above and below the rack we have to have a food rack too of course obviously we have to be able to say sense the temperature in the oven to decide when it's uh, uh, too hot or when it's uh, exceeds safety limits or when it exceeds the temperature that we desire temperature that we want we may have a toast function and we may have an oven function so maybe a cooking function and a toasting function um, so we might need a timer uh, both for the toasting function and also maybe for a cooking function um, we're going to build a metal enclosure so that um, that's got a nice door with some heat tempered glass in it and a control panel and and some kind of a base for it to sit on uh, and then it has to have a say a microprocessor that that can have some temperature sensors to read the temperature that can control uh, through relays or solid state relays of the coils and um, and, uh, and and then it has to also be able to drive the user interface um, the uh, it's going to have a plug to plug into the wall and a cord to bring uh, the power from the wall to the oven and then at some point you have to have a power supply to convert the 110 uh, AC voltage from the wall into uh, say a a, a, a a voltage that your uh, that your control electronics can run at maybe 5 volts or 3.3 volts uh, you can probably run your heaters directly on the uh, on the 110 volts, but you'll have to have some way to switch that on and off uh, with, from the, and the microprocessor has to be able to control those switches, those relays. You have to have maybe a display that displays what mode you're in, the remaining time, uh, and you want to have a nice robust user interface. So maybe you can use a potentiometer to adjust the, uh, the, the temperature uh, or maybe to set, uh, change the length of time, or maybe you can even use uh, up and down arrows to, to key in an exact time you want or something. Uh, you, want a, you want a user interface that doesn't take a bunch of training and that's satisfying and pleasant to use um, because in the end, uh, your, your customers, uh, are, their primary experience with this oven is gonna be the user interface. And if you have a great user interface, uh, that's going to look good. If you have a really bad user interface, even if the oven itself is, is otherwise really well made, uh, they're going to think about the uh, they're going to think about that user interface primarily. Uh, so so 
so we will do an, an, a, for, potentially an in-class exercise to go over this and just to really try and think through, okay, what are the requirements that we need? What's, and then, then, then we're gonna break these down. Uh, we'll come up with a block diagram describing kind of the various functional parts. Uh, that'll be our second step. And then a third step, we'll come up with uh, what our state machine has to look like to provide all the control functions. Then we're gonna pick all our components so that we can meet the system requirements. So like for instance, how, how, how many watts do our heating elements have to be? What voltage should they run at? Um, how, how big should our relays be? What amperage do they have to control uh, to turn the heaters on and off? And uh, we also have to look at uh, with a given level of wattage on the heaters, how long does it take to toast a piece of toast? We don't want that to be a ridiculously long time. So we're, so we're gonna have to uh, talk to the marketing people and see what what their desires are for length of time to, to toast a nice you know get a nice piece of to toast toasted um, and just a whole and size of the oven how big does it does the opening have to be uh, what are some considerations there and, and again the marketing guys are going to have some some thoughts about how they want to market this thing and so we have to keep that all in consideration uh, and then uh, and then at some point we're going to figure out algorithms for how we're going to control everything and how we're going to run the user interface and how we're going to allow the user to control the function of the oven. And then finally, we're going to build a uh, uh, we're going to build an actual uh, uh, test article where we can uh, we can try our algorithms and and see how they see if they work as the way we think they should to see if they're functionally uh, working correctly or if we have big problems. And then and then we're going to iterate. Uh, these last couple of steps where we'll, we'll Im improve our prototype, uh, we'll, we'll uh, sort of work on it some more, uh, and we'll try and get it to the point where, uh, where the whole team and the marketing people can sign off on it. And then we're gonna go through some more steps to, uh, to make sure it's something we can actually manufacture efficiently. And there's all sorts of considerations for that. Picking our uh, maybe more specific components, we might wanna upsize or downsize some to get more robust performance or to save costs. Uh, because we have more robustness than we need, and uh, and so forth, and it, eventually we'll have a we'll we'll have a toaster oven developed, and it'll be uh, something that can and it can be manufactured efficiently, and we'll be ready to uh, to uh, try and get it marketed to the public and make some money. All right, so that pretty much covers what I wanted to cover in this chapter. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more in chapter 18. Uh, about algorithms and about how to think about these things. Um, so uh, we will see you then in chapter 18.